God, it gets worse. In one instance, a group of Benheads went as far as attempting to dig up his parents' graves because what? they were under this belief that's that maybe weird. there was a clue to where the treasure was hidden. That's terrible. assembly of mysteries uncovered, treasures hidden, and the adventure waiting in the heart of nature's mystique. Are we going on a treasure hunt? I think we're going on a treasure hunt this week, Adam. Well, I'll pack my bag, I'm ready. Are you ready? You got your compass? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my map. Good boy. Let's go. For those of you tuning in for the first time, I'm your host, Kyle Reese. I'm the one who has the affinity for cryptic poems and the scent of adventure in the mountain air. And I'm your co-host, Adam Cox, and I'm the one who's never far behind, always ready with a map and a healthy scope of scepticism when it comes to hidden treasure. Why are you sceptical? Well, you told me that there's treasure and you say things and then they don't happen. Oh, have I let you down just one too many times, have I? Just one too many. Oh, I'm so sorry. So Adam, what have you been up to this week? Since Jennifer Pan's episode, I bet you've been feeling really grateful that your parents' only expectation of you growing up was that the cutlery was the right way around rather than poor Jennifer Pan, who was subjected to having to achieve a pharmacology degree. Well, do you know what? Since that episode, I came across another story of another young adult in America that had lied to his parents and said that he went to, I think, a particular college and had was heading for a job at SpaceX. Oh, really? Yeah, so there's a guy called Chandler Henderson, Halderson. I think he's 23 years old, and he'd been lying to his parents about all of this, and then not he didn't hire a hitman. He actually killed his parents himself. Oh, he himself killed them with his bare hands? With a shotgun, and actually, I think, cut one of them up. So they found their remains dismembered. It wasn't like a cannibal kind of story, was it? No. Oh, these but, people. Yeah, the fact that people go to the lengths that they go to and then they feel like this is the only way out. Yeah. And why does he want to work for Elon Musk anyway? I know. He's he's an idiot. Hey, this is what big family expectations, this is the effect that it has on people, basically. You've got to be nicer to your kids, man, because they're the ones who are going to be looking after you when you're old. And if you're really hard on them, hey, they might not be looking after you. Or just have low expectations. Just hope that your kids don't amount to much. Like your parents with the whole (laughs) knife and fork being the right way around. Yeah, sometimes I got it right. You turned out well, though. You should be grateful for that. So shall we jump into all the latest things? Let's do it. What have you got for us this week? So uh, the, well, actually, real quick one, first of all. Mm -hmm. So I found this article on this website called Healthline, all about the seven best hangover cures agreed by scientists. And guess what number one was? Don't drink. Limit your alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. That is not a cure. It's I know, a preventative right? measure. Anyway, have you ever heard of an American TV show called Family Feud that's hosted by Steve Harvey? Is that not Family Fortunes? Oh, I don't know. Is that a British TV show? Because I might not be familiar with it. Yeah, wasn't it Les Dennis? I can't remember. But that's where you have two families either side mm-hmm. and survey said and there's points on the board. Yes, that's exactly it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. How do you not know Family Fortunes? I just never watched British TV shows. In 30 I've, years, you haven't watched. I probably have seen it. We have that board game, the top 10 survey things. What is that board game that we play? Um, yeah, it's kind of like that. What is that board game called? I don't know. Tenor? Anyway. So, yes, Family Feud is obviously a TV game show where two families compete to guess popular responses to survey questions. Now, each round starts with a face-off question, and the team that that wins then gets to play the main question at the end. So an example question might be, name something that you might see in the sky. And the top five responses based on survey results would be like airplane, bird, cloud, sun, stars. And the team with the most points by the end of the game goes to play the fast money round for a chance to win cash prizes. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming you're very familiar with this because you're the one who educated me. It's like I'm mansplaining to you now. What? You are, it's I'm, quite insulting. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's for those listeners that had no idea what this is so there's this contestant called tim 
Blythnik, and he is most remembered for his response to Steve Harvey's question, what's the biggest mistake that you've made at a wedding? And Tim replied, honey, I love you, but saying I do was the biggest mistake that I made. Oh, Ooh, I know. Like, I can understand him saying that in jest, but that cringe moment afterwards when it sinks in that you've just said that on television. Yeah. Not good. But months after the show, Tim has now been accused of murdering his estranged wife because Becky was found shot 14 times and he is the number one suspect. So that was a bit of foreshadowing. Isn't that crazy? That's no way. I've been thinking about that all week. I don't know what their life was, but he couldn't have been happy, but he results in him going going off to shoot his wife. Yeah, regardless, I don't think he should be shooting her. No, nothing ever justifies that to a degree. To a degree. (laughs) And that was a joke. (laughs) Yeah, so that was all my latest news for this week. What have you got for us? Well, have you ever lost your phone in public? I have lost my phone in Tesco. <laughs> yeah, you did, didn't you? Um, I've been on like a roller coaster and someone's phone slipped out and it's mm-hmm. fallen like down into a pond or something in, in the water and it, you think it's gone. There's no way I can get that back. Okay, yeah. Well, one Indian official was taking a selfie, not necessarily on a roller coaster, he was taking a selfie, and he dropped his phone in a reservoir. And so he did work for the government, so it did contain some sensitive information. Mm-hmm. Rather than just blocking that phone or whatever you need to do to just... You know, What's on. in the water? It's probably going to die very soon, right? Exactly. No, what he do didn't do? do that. No. He instead drained the reservoir of 2 million <gasps> litres of water in order to get his phone back. So over three days, more than 2 million litres of water were pumped from the reservoir and he did get the phone back and the phone was waterlogged and it wouldn't turn on. So what a waste of time and money. What an idiot. This is like a prime example of how like power can get to someone's head, right? Mm -hmm. Where they feel entitled to waste government resources draining 2 million litres of water from a reservoir Mm -hmm. just to get... He probably a wasn't, he, I bet you any money, he had no concern about the sensitive information on there. He just wanted his phone back because how is he going to do his snappity chats? Snappity chats. But yeah, so the amount of water would be enough to cover 1,500 acres of land. So I completely agree. He had no thought for anyone else or any other wildlife mm-hmm. or anything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I thought that was a bit ridiculous. So yeah, that's if you Idiot. lose your phone, that's always an option. Yeah. That was a good one. So, you are listening to The Compendium, an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things. We are a weekly variety podcast where I, Kyle Reese, tell Adam, my map-reading, riddle-solving co-host, all about a topic that I think you'll both find interesting and fascinating. That's right. I'm still sceptical there. So, what are you serving up today? Well, Adam, in today's episode of The Compendium, I want you to brace yourself Because today I'm taking you on an adventure that is both enticing and mystifying. I want you to picture a vast expanse of rugged, majestic wilderness stretching out as far as the eye can see. Got it? I think so. Now this landscape is punctuated by towering peaks, winding rivers and dense, whispering forests. Okay. This is the Rocky Mountains, a geological marvel. It spans across the North American continent. Now, Adam, let me ask you something, and I want you to really consider your answer. If you knew that hidden somewhere within the sprawling landscape, there was a chest overflowing with gold nuggets, rare coins, precious gemstones, and other priceless treasures worth a total of five million US dollars, just hidden there, waiting for you to simply walk up to it, pluck it out of the wilderness, no questions asked, finders, keepers, would you grab a map and a compass and head off on a treasure hunt like in the Goonies? Or would you just think this was an old wives' tale? How long is it going to take me? Potentially 10 years. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, you're not really one for commitment, are you? No, 10 years is a long time. Maybe get win something or find something. So I don't know. I'll Maybe someone else can have a head start and I'll join them in like year nine. Yeah, pick up like on some of their clues. Yeah. You sound like the kind of person that would do that, you know, take advantage of someone else's hard work, claim it for yourself, right? <laughs> Mm, yeah all right well what if i told you adam that this was true 
and there really was a chest of pirate booty waiting somewhere in the vast expanse of the Rocky Mountains. In today's episode of The Compendium, I'm going to be telling you about a man called Forrest Fenn, who is a rich, eccentric art dealer who was captivated by adventure and ancient artifacts. Um, art people are always eccentric. Someone like an art teacher, they're eccentric. An art dealer, they're eccentric. Yeah. If you deal with arts, then you're eccentric. Yeah, I guess. Well, the thing is, though, he's like a modern day Indiana Jones. Picture that in your head, right? Has he got a whip? He probably has a whip somewhere. (laughs) Probably. But he keeps that at home. That's it. Yeah. So this guy, Forrest Fenn, he hides a chest full of treasure for a worldwide treasure hunt. One that has spanned an entire decade and has led to thousands of treasure seekers off on a quest across the Rocky Mountains to find it. So first, we probably want to explore who Forrest Fenn is, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go for it. So Forrest Fenn was an American art dealer. He's an author and an antiques collector. He was born on August 22nd in 1930 in Temple, Texas. Now, Fenn had a diverse and intriguing background that ended up greatly influencing his career. In his early years, Fenn showed a strong affinity for exploring the outdoors, and he was captivated by stories of treasure hunts and adventure. And after graduating from high school, he enlisted in the United States Air Force, where he served as a fighter pilot during the Korean War. And Fenn's time in the military acts to further fuel this love for exploration and that thrill of adventure. Now, after his military service, Fenn attends the University of Texas in Austin, where he earns a degree in art and archaeology. This lays the foundation for his future career as an art dealer and an antiques collector. And Fenn's passion for art and historical artifacts leads him to establish a really highly prestigious gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Now, as an art dealer, Fenn specializes in various Native American and Southwestern artifacts, amassing a really impressive collection of paintings and sculptures and other artifacts. Now, early on, he quickly becomes well-known for his expertise in the field and he develops a reputation for his ability to discover various hidden gems and rare treasures. Many of the artifacts that he had collected, he just had no right selling whatsoever. He'd stolen them or he'd acquired them through breaking the law. Mm -hmm. So an example of some of those things that he would trade in would be like human hair, bones, exotic ivories. And those were just some of the things that he had kind of logged in his inventory. So why was he trading with those again? Well, because there is a demand for it, right? People want these weird artifacts. They want these Indian headdresses. They want these shrunken skulls from Papua New Guinea right, and things like you. that. Yeah, so a lot of them are quite sought after. But also at the same time, a lot of them are illegal because just of how about, they're sourced. I was just about to say, but aren't some of them illegal? But he was, obviously, I imagine he could get quite a lot of money from these then. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, he did boast that he had many celebrity clients too. And that's probably where a lot of his wealth came from. Some of the more notable clients were like Jackie Kennedy Onassis, Steven Spielberg, Steve Martin, John Wayne, and of course Cher. She for a time claimed that she was like Cherokee or like Native American, didn't she? Which turns out that she isn't. But I guess Mm. at one point she was really fascinated with that idea. I mean, when she was claiming this, it wasn't as taboo as it is now. I mean, everyone in the 1990s was apparently from North American kind of heritage. I think the idea is that she's 100% not <laughs> North American, South American, North, what do you call it? Native, Native American. American, sorry. Ugh. So in 1988, Forrest is diagnosed with terminal kidney cancer. He's 58 at the time, which is devastating. Doctors talk him through his treatment options, after which he opts for chemo and surgery. They tell him that his best case scenario is that he has a 20% chance of living another three years at maximum. So not that good then. It's not a great prognosis. He's obviously devastated by this as well. But he does very quickly accept it. But on the condition that he wasn't just going to wither away and die in a hospital bed. Instead, he's determined to bow out on his own terms. He has a lot of admiration for his father, who basically done something very similar when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer a few years earlier. His father put all his affairs in order, said his goodbyes, and then ate like a fistful of sleeping pills and just never woke up. 
So Forrest decides that he wants to do exactly the same thing, but he wants to do it with a bit more of a flourish. So he starts planning this sort of romantic death for himself where he is going to walk out into the Rocky Mountains. He's going to lay down under a tree, which is his favorite spot in the whole world. He's going to take a bunch of opioids and he's just going to fall asleep and he's never going to wake up. But there is going to be a twist because he's planning to die next to a chest full of treasure. His vision is that his skeleton would just lay there for a few years next to this box with some of the most precious items from his collection until someone just stumbles across it. So, sorry, that's his chest that he's putting his stuff in. Yeah, so he is going to bring his own treasure. So this idea that he wants to go off into the wilderness and die is quite like a scene from Indiana Jones as an old man going, Mm. I'm done. But then, against all odds, Forrest does make a miraculous recovery. And he manages to beat the cancer. All of the treatments appear to have worked. And five years later, he's declared completely cancer-free. So now there's no need for him to go off wandering into the wilderness to die. He can just continue to live a happy life with his family, which he absolutely does. But because he has spent so much time and effort planning this kind of romantic legacy death, he can't quite give up on the idea of this treasure hunt. So over the next 20 years, bringing us right up to 2010, Mm -hmm. Forrest continues collecting various unique precious items like nuggets of gold, rubies, sapphires, rings, all sorts of things, various artifacts from all around the world. Forrest's aim was to make this collection of things look like literal pirate treasure, Mm -hmm. which he plans on then placing into a 12th century bronze box, which itself was extremely valuable on its own. So finally, in 2010, he is getting close to his 80th birthday. He decides that it's finally time to launch the treasure hunt. So Forrest wanders off into the Rocky Mountains National Park and leaves the treasure in the very same special place where he had planned to end his life more than 20 years before. And then, when he's satisfied, he just walks back to the car, chuckles to himself, and then leaves. Forrest never confirms where he buries the treasure, ever. He gets ready to execute the very next stage of his plan. So a few months later, in 2010, he publishes his memoir titled The Thrill of the Chase. And the memoir is a 271-page biographical account of his own life, which offers glimpses into his personal adventures, his successes, and various challenges that he's faced in his life. Now, in it, Forrest shares his love for the outdoors, describing his deep, soulful connection with nature, particularly the Rocky Mountains. Also, in his memoir, he tells readers that he has hidden a secret treasure somewhere out there and offers a cryptic poem that he claims to contain the clues to where the location of the treasure is. So, we're going to read that poem now. Fancy it? Okay. If everyone is listening, get a pen and paper ready. <laughs> Did you want to read paragraph by paragraph? You take the first one, I'll take the next one. Do paragraph by paragraph. Okay, sure. Great. You go first. As I have gone alone in there, and with my treasures bold, I can keep my secret where and hint of riches new and old. Begin it where warm waters halt, and take it in the canyon down. Not far, but too far to walk. Put it below the home of brown. From there it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. There'll be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. If you've been wise and found the blaze, look quickly down your quest to cease. But Tari scanned with marvel gaze, just take the chest and go in peace. So why is it that I must go and leave my trove for all to seek? The answers I already know, I've done it tired and now I'm weak. So hear me all and listen good, your effort will be worth the cold. If you are brave and in the wood, I give you title to the gold. Um, It sounds, well, at first I got the impression it was near water. Mm-hmm. Uh, then potentially somewhere cold, so maybe high up, but not too high up. And he was—he did it when he was tired, so therefore it, it felt like a journey. Well, I don't know. This where is this place? This isn't going to be an exercise on where it is because the reality is, as you'll find out later, we never find out where it is. Did he even hide it? We're going to get into that. Let's put a pin in there. Okay. Because that's what we're going to explore, right? But the thoughts I want you to convey are, what are your thoughts on the poem? Because it takes him 15 years to write this poem, which in my opinion 
is a poor effort. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel like 15 years worth of work. No. And it doesn't sound like the poem that you would find from someone who is really into... He's just an art dealer though, right? Or Mm. whatever. So maybe he's not a poet. He might be an eccentric art person, but, you know, this isn't, this maybe isn't his, you know, strong suit. That's an amazing response because I think in the end when people start to realize that actually he isn't this weird, cryptic whiz with words. He's just, as you said, he's just an art dealer who wants a bit of mystique and adventure in his life. It feels like just someone's granddad has gone, oh, this will be fun Mm. and did it. And thinking he was, it was going to be this great big thing, mm. or bigger than it actually was, or more cryptic than it actually was. Sure. That's it. I think that's on the money, really. Let's carry on. So Forrest says when he wrote the poem, he wasn't playing any games. The poem is straightforward, and each word is deliberate. And that if a person reads the poem over and over again and deciphers the first few clues, he says they will find the treasure, basically. So... Back in his memoir, Forrest takes the unconventional route of personally overseeing the publication and distribution of the book to maintain entire control over its contents. So when it's ready to print, he only prints literally a thousand copies, which he then makes available through his own gallery and a few select local bookstores in the area. The thing to point out here, which I think is smart, is that he doesn't sell the books to any of these bookstores. He literally just donates them so that they can just make all the profit. He's got no interest in that side of things. And the reason for this is that he doesn't want to be accused of baiting people into buying his memoir by putting like a treasure map a treasure map into it, which I think also adds to like credibility that it, it has, the story has, and that he genuinely is just looking to kind of like forge a legacy for himself. He's not interested in the money, which I think is sweet. Smart move. So the book is out there. And he now makes a series of announcements through a combination of various interviews in the media where he tells the world that his great hope for the people will be to inspire them to explore the outdoors, particularly in this age where technology often keeps people indoors and disconnected from nature. So it's a very passionate monologue that he kind of delivers in these interviews. And So finally, at the end, he reveals that he has hidden the treasure chest somewhere in the mountains north of Santa Fe and that the clues to its whereabouts are in his memoir for people to find. Mm -hmm. He says that with imagination, a good mind and a little resolve, anyone, like anyone, can find the treasure. Even the old, even if you're 100 years old, even they can find the treasure which I think is a pretty big clue, which a lot of people overlook. Like he does emphasize that anyone can find the treasure. I did get the feeling that it was going to be like a trek to get there. Mm. But now that you've said that, yeah. you got to remember that he's also hidden the treasure himself at the age of 80 years old. So he hasn't trekked anywhere. He hasn't climbed any mountains. That's true. He's gone ahead. He's probably driven somewhere. He's gone out of his car. He's walked a short distance. He's probably placed it down. And that's where he's hidden it. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people forget that as well. And again, it's because he's this big adventurer. They kind of misinterpret who he is as a human being. And basically, he also says that if you can find it, you can keep it. So Forrest is super proud. He says that this is for every redneck out there with a pickup truck and six kids who's lost his job during the global financial crisis, whose life is lacking adventure. This is for them. <laughs> every redneck. Every redneck. Ah, oh, that's good. He's doing it for all the rednecks out yeah. there. Yeah. And again, remember 2010. So it is just after the global financial crisis as well. So yeah. people are like really down on their luck and it's his way of lifting up their spirits. I get it. It's like the average Joe, but the fact that he just called out rednecks, I just like, you You guys need this. Get God damn it, Billy Bob. <laughs> get the memoir and get hunting. <laughs> get the shotgun, please. I'm going to get me some book. <laughs> Can you read Cletus? Well, that's really um, offensive. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. For the one redneck listening. So he's doing this for other people, but he's also trying to, of course, as we've already discussed, secure his own legacy. At the time, this causes a bit of a stir amongst a small number of people. It takes a couple of years to really build up steam, but by 2012, more and more TV shows start reporting the hunt. This is the point where people start to really become captivated by this notion of hidden treasure just hiding somewhere out there, some people get really invested. 
So much so that some people quit their jobs and they move to the Rocky Mountains. They uproot their entire life and they dedicate their entire existence to trying to find this treasure. They quit their jobs on, on the basis that we might find, if he's telling the truth at this point, mm-hmm. they're just assuming that he is. And he's 80 years old. Mm-hmm. Wom's if he's got a bit of dementia. What and if he's he forgets like, where he's oh, Where did I... And which was it that tree oh no was it wasn't that tree was it this yeah. canyon i don't know did i even bring treasure he might have just brought like his spare pair of socks he might have done yeah so by 2016 it was estimated that there were about 65,000 people who were on the hunt for this treasure these are kind of estimates that are based on forum numbers from the different online communities it's quite called- a lot 65,000. Oh, yeah. And it grows even more. Like, this is early on still. This is like a modern day pirate treasure hunt, isn't it? Like, mm. in terms of, imagine this is what pirates would have done. They would have set sail. Yeah, but 65,000, right? Can you imagine if there were actual pirates, all the cannons blazing at and killing each other and sinking of ships and wenches? And wenches and yeah, yeah all sorts. That's offensive to wenches. <laughs> So the various members of these communities call themselves the Fenheads. And together, they basically are working together to meticulously scrutinize and try and decipher the clues in his memoir. But ultimately, up to this point in time, nobody has managed to find the treasure at all. As a result, many Fenheads start to become more and more skeptical, as you said, about whether or not the treasure even exists. Is this just a senile old man who's just dropped some pills in a box and, yeah, that's his treasure? I mean, to him, that might be treasure. One man's trash is another man's treasure. One man's kidney dialysis pills is another man's treasure. It's like insulin in America. I mean, if I had given up my job and I've been searching for this treasure for like a couple of years, whatever this is... I can't picture how vast the landscape is. I know it's going to be big. So I guess that's going to take a while. This is a huge landscape. It is the third biggest mountain range in the world. That's pretty it's huge. Big. It's massive. So actually, just to go through just how enormous the Rocky Mountains are, the mountain range stretches for 3,000 miles from wow. British Columbia, Canada, right down to New Mexico, which makes this the third largest mountain range in the world. British Columbia where New Mexico. Yeah, Canada. That's huge. Top of Canada. It's massive. That's all of America pretty much, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Pretty much, yeah. Also, Forrest says that he's hidden the treasure somewhere north of Santa Fe. Now, Santa Fe is in New Mexico. So it's not like he's given <laughs> anyone a head start. He's literally at the very bottom, at the start of the Rocky Mountains in New Mexico. And oh, yeah, it's just... It's just basically in, in the Rocky Mountains just, anyway. Yeah, keep heading north and you'll find it. Yeah, north of Santa Fe. Oh, but the Rocky Mountain starts 20 miles to the south. Yeah, it doesn't give anyone much of a clue, does it? Wow, well, okay. I didn't quite picture how big that is, but that's... It's huge. Yeah, this is a pun. So in total, the area that we're covering here is half a million miles. Bloody hell. <laughs> so I think they're underestimating just how big the Rocky Mountains are. So by 2019... Estimates place the total community numbers around about 500,000. And the community isn't just confined to the US. People are literally traveling in from Australia, from Norway, the UK, Kenya, Russia. And they're all there to team up with people that are on the ground in the United States to combine kind of their, their collective knowledge. Also, Forrest is really super engaged in the community as well. He says that at its peak, he was receiving 100 emails a day from various fenheads and he would apparently reply to all of them and don't forget he's 86 at this age as well can you imagine how many emails do you deal with on a day-to-day basis yes a lot it's a full-time job what he's what he's doing here it is i guess that's all he's got though if he's retired then fine but still a hundred emails a day i try avoid writing even three emails i'm like no maybe he's just typing them going you're not even close don't bother (laughs) go home uh, he would also happily meet people, which would sometimes lead to Forrest inviting them to stay with him at his house. Now, at this point, the treasure hunt has very much become his entire purpose in his life. In an interview, he says that he hopes he dies before the treasure is found, because once it's found, then he would like have nothing left. This is pretty much oh. the only thing that's keeping him going at this moment in time. I remember when I was working at 
the Oakland Hotel. I was the restaurant manager. And because it was a hotel, they would also serve breakfast in the morning. And they had this old lady, I think her name was Joyce, and she was tasked with just making the breakfast. And she must have been 90, and she would come in every day, 5 a.m. in the morning. She would start breakfast, ready for 7 o'clock for the guests to eat. And I remember one year she had slipped when she was walking outside. And when we were putting into the ambulance to go to the hospital, she said that she's afraid that she wouldn't be able to come back to work because if she doesn't come back to work, she doesn't think that she will live very long, much longer. It just goes to show, like, some people, they find purpose in just really small things, right? It's what's keeping her going every day. Yeah. And I think maybe this the same thing might be happening with Forrest here. This is his last big quest in life, right? He's kind of hoping to see it through. But you said that he was hoping he would die before it's found. Because he, he's worried that if he lives a lot longer afterwards, then he'll have nothing to live for. Okay. Yeah, so I guess in, to him, he wants to die within this adventure. Okay. So while Forrest Fenn took great pride in what he had accomplished, others had a very different perspective on what he had done. His actions unintentionally caused issues across the entire mountain range with people getting into various kind of forms of bother. The authorities were repeatedly urging Forrest to just call off the treasure hunt because people were trespassing onto private or restricted land. They were getting themselves shot or killed as a result of it. People were causing damage to the local environment by digging various holes or cutting down trees or like attempting to move giant boulders because they think the treasure is hidden underneath it. He's made everyone a nuisance. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Should he? Because people like sue him for that. Yeah. Various, various court cases were flung against him for all sorts of reasons. Some of them are just mental. There was a surge of people also needing to be rescued by rescue helicopters because they were falling down cliffs and breaking their bones and things like that. One guy managed to impale himself on a branch. Jeez. Another guy got attacked by a bear and literally got his entire scalp scalped off. God. Mm. Tragically, five reports of confirmed deaths. So the authorities are constantly pleading with Forrest to just stop, but Forrest completely refuses. I think, again, as we said earlier on, to Forrest... This is like his last purpose in life. So calling off the treasure hunt is just not an option for him, mm -hmm. I think. When people go missing, though, he would fund various search parties to help him try to find these people. But in some cases, the families of the individuals who did lose loved ones, they made very strong efforts to try and hold him responsible. In an interview, Fenn makes a statement that might come across as insensitive where he says... If someone drowns in a swimming pool, you wouldn't just drain the pool permanently as a response, would you? Instead, what you would do is you would teach that person to swim. You say that, but that Indian guy, he drained the reservoir. That's true. Check you out. It's a synergy. Synergy. Yeah. Unagi, you knowing what this episode is all about. I, yeah. But yeah, but it's true. Like he, he's not responsible for these people getting themselves hurt, right? Forrest never actually accepts any accountability for any of the injuries or deaths, which I personally think is fine. He's not deliberately sending people out into the wilderness to get killed or impaled or to get hurt or scalped by a bear. So eventually he starts giving people a few extra clues to try and reduce the risk level. So he narrows down the search area to just the seven states of the United States and he excludes Canada. He specifically says that the treasure is hidden in an elevation no higher than 5,000 feet above sea level, which basically narrows the search down. He also clarifies that the treasure is not associated with any structures. So this line here, so begin where the warm waters halt and take it to the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk, put it below the home of Brown. Loads of people think for some reason that's some kind of weird toilet or an outhouse or something. Oh, really? I didn't get that. I thought Home of Brown, because it's a capital B, I figured it was that's referencing true. a place or a person or something like that, yeah. something notable. But idiots somehow think it's an outhouse, so they're digging up outhouses. So he's basically having to confirm that it's not a toilet, it's not a physical structure. He did encourage rednecks to do this hunt. So I guess Forrest just gets tired of people just sending him emails asking if shit was involved, I guess. So another clue reveals that the treasure is not hidden in a graveyard. He says that 
It's also not in Idaho and also not in Utah. And it's not in a mine. And also, he clarifies that the clue where the warm waters halt from the poem does not relate to a dam in any way, stopping people from obviously going and getting themselves in trouble by playing around various dams and things like that and potentially getting drowned. Mm -hmm. He also shares two quotes that emphasize the importance of using logic and avoiding overcomplicating the search. Forrest then reveals that out of everyone who has emailed him, that only two people had come within 100 meters of the treasure, but he never reveals who those two people are. Now, you've got to remember, that's 500,000 people at this point that are actively searching, that only two people that he knows of have come close. You said he was getting 100 emails a day. Mm. So only two out of those emails. Yeah. And even then, they weren't necessarily that close. They were just the closest. Mm -hmm. Now, despite Forrest being in his element at this point, there are some challenging moments for him. Some individuals start stalking him and his family hoping to extract information or observe him heading out to maybe check on the treasure. As a result, Forrest has to kind of resort to issuing various restraining orders just to kind of really keep himself safe from these individuals. Yeah. To, to, yeah, stay away from me and stop following me. Oh my God, it gets worse. No, in one instant, a group of Benheads went as far as attempting to dig up his parents' graves because what? they were under this misguided belief That's that maybe where... there was a clue to where the treasure was hidden within their remains. That's terrible. It is terrible. The take, wow, people took what was supposed to be quite innocent mm. and quite fun and really, wow, yeah. People just take things too far. People just spoil everything. There's only five million, right? Five million, yeah, worth five million dollars, yeah. Yeah, wow. It's still a lot of money, obviously, but mm. yeah. Well, there are some people who try to sue him for their injuries. Some argue that they had given up their jobs, resulting in a loss of income. One guy believes that because he had spent so much time and so much effort and energy into finding the treasure, that he should just be entitled to it. And so he tries to sue Forrest for withholding the treasure from him. And the court initially obviously dismissed the case. Also, one woman apparently came forward alleging that Forrest had sexually harassed her by asking her for nude photographs, obviously. What? I know. This, poor, this old man. I know, he's like 86 at this point. Jeez. So, like, does it even work? Well, that's beside the point, but to, to accuse someone, that's very... Yeah, it doesn't go well for her. She yeah. gets completely, like, obliterated by the online community. And I don't Good. think it really comes anything comes of it yeah i mean it may be true we can't we can't discount that but like he is 86 years old i feel like doing looking for nudes i just feel like that you shouldn't be doing that to someone if that's quite a, a very that could cause a lot of problems if that was and if it's yeah. not true then why would you even bring that up well, the thing like is that. though it doesn't come of anything anyway mm -hmm. so i think it's safe to say unless it's come of something mm -hmm. or unless some kind of case has been filed we can just Put it down Ignore as buhaki. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he's 90 years old. Poor guy. As time goes on, still no one manages to find the treasure, which leads some again to doubt whether or not it even existed. Mm -hmm. Some even start to accept this notion that it's all about the satisfaction in the adventure itself, realizing that the intangible experience gained from it was a reward enough. But I'm like, fuck off. Like, where's the damn treasure? <laughs> yeah, especially the lengths that people have gone to, quitting their jobs, losing their lives, and for it to be like, oh, yeah, it was just the journey. That's it. Others obviously feel angry. They were hoping for actual real-life treasure. There was also some speculation that someone had already found the treasure but decided to keep it a, a secret. But at the time, Forrest debunks this because he believes that the notoriety and recognition of finding the treasure would outweigh the material value. So he doesn't believe that anyone would just find the treasure and then keep it a secret. So on the 6th of June 2020, after a decade-long hunt, a treasure is finally found. And I guess that's in the middle of just at the start of COVID, right? Yeah, it's about three months into it. So I think that's when you could start doing groups of six, maybe? Yeah, I guess if it's going or to be found anytime, it's going to be found then, right? Everyone's on furlough. <laughs> yeah, so out for a walk, use that time. Yeah, why not? So the individual who finds it contacts Forrest via email. Then a few weeks later, 
Horace publicly confirms that the treasure had indeed been found. To validate the authenticity of the discovery, he shares a photograph of himself with the treasure itself. And yeah, the treasure is found. All Fenn says is that the person came from back east. Also, the exact location where the treasure was found is uh-huh. never revealed at all. And we'll explain why in a second. I want to know if I could then match the for the description of the poem. Yes. That'd been good to know. Be like, that That's not been. it. Exactly. That would have been awesome to know, but no. We never we never find out where it is. And there is a very good reason for it. Naturally, this makes people really, really angry. And so people start saying that he told someone where the treasure was hidden to deliberately stop the hunt. Uh, okay. Others also claim that there never was any treasure. Again, we've heard that before. Mm-hmm. Some people couldn't accept that the treasure hunt was over, thinking that it was just a sneaky trick on him to get people to stop searching. So they just continue looking. But it doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Especially they've been looking for this for 10 years. And they're like, I gave up, yeah, I yeah. gave up everything to do this. Mm. I guess people, it's hard for people to accept certain things, yeah. right? So in July, Forrest reveals that the treasure was found actually in Wyoming. And this is all he's willing to disclose. The reason why he doesn't say the exact location for where the treasure is, is because he's really worried that people might start visiting the site as a kind of like a sort of pilgrimage. Because you also got to remember, like, this site is really significant to him. This is where he was going to walk into the wilderness in 1988 and, and just take his own life. So yeah. this is a sacred site to him. Of course, he doesn't want people to know where it is, right? Mm-hmm. We also find out at this point that it's Forrest who is the one who encourages the person who found the treasure to stay anonymous. Apparently, Forrest sharing some of his own experiences having to deal with the crazy morons within the kind of the online community just persuades this guy to want to stay anonymous. I would I would agree with that. I'd imagine he'd have like death threats, people turning up on his door wanting to see it, all mm. that kind of stuff. For sure. And that's exactly what Forrest had to deal with. Mm. People stalking him and all sorts of things. And then a few months later in September 2020, just two weeks after Forrest turns 90, Forrest Fenn dies, proving that his purpose was essentially done. And but yeah, when you said before, that's what was keeping him going. That was what was keeping him going two months yeah. after. It's really sad. Mm. After Forrester's death, a Fenhead who had been on the hunt for like literally years, like since the beginning, she's a practicing lawyer. She decides that she's going to file a lawsuit against Forrest Fenn's estate. Essentially, she hopes that this lawsuit will reveal the name of the man who found the treasure. Mm-hmm. Her plan is to then file a lawsuit against that person because she believes that someone had hacked her phone and her emails and stole various records of where the treasure was hidden. So like notes that she'd been keeping. Really? Someone's Mm. gone to that extreme? That's what she's claiming. So basically, she believes that the treasure is rightfully hers, which I think is just idiotic. Then did she know where it was then? If she knew where it was, why did she not go out and get it? Yeah. You had all the time. What have you been doing? The guy who finds the treasure knows that this lawsuit is coming up and he doesn't obviously want to have to deal with the potential fallout for it. Because actually in America, right, there isn't this kind of no win, no fee thing when it comes to lawsuits. If you someone takes you to court, you have to come up with the money to defend yourself in court. Mm -hmm. And he obviously he doesn't want to do that because there's going to be left in debt. So as a result... He just decides to introduce himself to the media before any legal issues could arise. Okay. It turns out that his name is a guy. Sorry. It turns out that his name is Jack Stueth. He is a 32-year-old medical student from Michigan. Jack says he spent two years searching for the treasure independently, not getting caught up in, this is amazing, in any of the online sleuth activity. Sleuth activity. Sleuth activity, which must be a massive kick in the face to all those 500,000 people who are like all working together, scrutinizing those clues and stuff. And then someone who's not even part of the community, just deliberately disconnected, goes and finds it. I guess you could be misled quite as much as that could be helpful. You could be misled and people saying, no, it can't be that Mm. because of this. And actually, no, it might, you know. That's exactly what happens. Jack says that he spent a lot of time just studying Fenn's way of writing and speaking in interviews uh, and then applying what Fenn says to the poem. Okay. Jack says that a lot of the online community were really caught up in this assumption that Forrest Fenn was like obsessed with 
games and puzzles and logical kind of challenges, but actually he wasn't. Um, he says that he didn't even think that Horace was even all that sophisticated as a writer, which I, I think if we look at the, the poem, I think we can gather that. Yeah. Really. Which is partly why Jack decides to work on his own, because when he points this out, Fenheads jump to the defensive. So he's like this. I'll just do it on my own. It's like, how dare you say that? He is our savior. Yeah, he's like a cult following, right? Yeah. So his strategy, he says, is to keep it really simple. And he just sort of puts himself in forest shoes. He wants to focus on the romantic aspect of the treasure hunt because early on, Jack recognizes that Forrest's interest is in storytelling and narrative, specifically his adventures and the idea of varying kind of pirate treasure rather than the tricky double meaning and mm. wordplay, etc. Finally, Jack does share a picture of himself with Fenn and the treasure showing the world that he actually did find it. Mm -hmm. He did warn people via the media before he came forward that he'd already invested in a ton of high-level security, which I guess Forrest's warning did sink in. So at the time, Jack says that he's definitely going to sell the treasure, but at the moment, he isn't sure if he should sell the whole thing at auction or just piece by piece and sell it off separately. I'd imagine because of all the story behind it, you might be able to get like a all the treasure from Forrest then mm -hmm. might be able to get like a good deal on that. Well, I think that's what he wants, right? He, want, he wants to kind of someone to buy all the treasure so they can display it. Mm -hmm. But then he also understands that if he sells them individually, then the Fen heads, which I, I guess he probably doesn't have that much sympathy for, mm. might want to own like a piece of history. Interesting. And then people yeah. are more willing. But then maybe that like people will then hunt down each other, all the other Fen heads in order to get all the treasure. Maybe. Yeah. That's, that's the sequel <laughs> film that is treasure hunt Two: the revenge <laughs> the revenge of the rockies <laughs> like i said he hopes to find someone who wants to display the collection publicly so he wants to ideally sell the whole thing finally in december 2022 five six months ago yeah yeah he sells the treasure at auction for a total of 1.3 million dollars which is supposed what? to be worth yeah 1.3 $1.3 million. In fact, the exact price is $1,307,946. That's how much it sells for. But unless, it's supposed to be worth like $5 million. Yeah, unless he spent like $3.7 million on security. I think this is the, the total amount that he sold it for. So that the rest of that money will come out. Yeah, fair yeah. point. That doesn't seem... And he's still got to pay tax on that probably. Unless he kept a bit back. I feel like it's been shortchanged. But that's the, the, the sell price. Mm. The, the things that people spend their money on nowadays makes you question, makes you wonder whether or not that's actually true. Because yeah. I don't think so. People spend like 50 quid on stupid idiot things. Anyway. So total that. So he his aim is to pay off his medical school debts. And then his strategy is to become a financial advisor. Like he's a medical student. So I don't know. Maybe he's had a taste of, clearly not, because he's been shortchanged there. He could have sold it for 5 million and now, May yeah, maybe he, maybe he wants to work how he can make that 1.3 into a 5 million. Possibly. So Forrest has secured his legacy. And at the same time, he's become a legend, really. I think it's awesome. It's a, I think it's a really nice story. Like, I appreciate people were hurt and mm -hmm. died, unfortunately. But the idea was this was supposed to be quite a nice Yeah, the thing. intent was positive. Yeah. I'm really happy for him. I'm mm -hmm. glad he got his legacy. The story has really inspired like a bunch of other treasure hunts all over the world. There's also this great book by Daniel Barbarisi. He was one of the first people to start reporting on the Fen treasure hunt, like becoming entranced by the search himself. Now, the book is entitled Chasing the Thrill, where he documents his own journey in the hunt. It's definitely worth reading if you get the chance. I'll share some links and pictures in the show notes if you want to have a bit more of a deep dive into the story. But... Yeah, that's the story of Fen and his hidden treasure. I like, and that's inspired other sort of treasure hunts. So th what ones are active today? I'd like to know. So there's one guy who has hidden a billion dollars worth of jewelry across the world. Yeah, there's this big treasure hunt. Any clues as to where? Each no idea. Month? I haven't really looked into it, but I've just seen the headline for it. Well, I, that's what we need to add to our to-do list. Yeah, a billion dollars worth of jewelry. Yeah. yeah. And so the guy that came forward, he didn't reveal where he found it either. 
No, he didn't. And I think he, that yeah. is at Forrest's wishes, wishes I guess. Time. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd like to know whether it was it was buried, was it up a tree, was it behind a rock? I think it was either just in a really small ditch that was uncovered or just covered by maybe a plank of wood or, I don't know, a trapdoor or some foliage or hidden in a bush. I don't think it was hidden anywhere sophisticated. Mm. He said that anyone can go and get the treasure. Yeah. I don't think he needed a, a shovel. I don't think he needed any dynamites. I don't think he needed any climbing equipment or anything like that. I think you could have just walked up to the treasure and plucked it out. Yeah. Of the environment out of the wilderness. That's cool. Yeah. That's really nice. I do I think it would be cool though to know exactly where it was. Yeah. I wonder if we'll ever find out. So thank you very much for listening. And as always, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode and any others. You can find us on Instagram at the Compendium Podcast, where we share updates, highlights, and interesting snippets from all of our episodes. If you'd like to reach out to us directly, then you can drop us a line at the Compendium Pod gmail.com please 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 subscribe and share so that we can continue to spread the love and keep growing our show and as always stay curious until next week bye yeah.